So the session is looking ahead uh, library workforce and um, the sessions today look really fascinating and um, looking at some really essential work that's being done to support all of our innovative library developments. It's our library teams that underpin everything we can do. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more um, about the initiatives that they're involved in. So without further ado, I'll introduce the first um, set of speakers. We've got William J. Nixon, Assistant Director from the University of Glasgow, and Fiona Courage, Assistant Director from the University of Sussex. And they're going to be talking to us about revolution. So are we ready for this revolution? They're going to be discussing the um, digital workforce development strategy, which if you've all had a look through the RL UK strategy, I've got it well scribbled over there. I'm really looking forward to this. I think as we're all coming out of the pandemic um, and developing our digital services, it's really important to think about our workforce and teams. So I will hand over to William and Fiona. Thank you very much, Nancy, and really appreciate that introduction. Um, so I'm delighted to be here with Fiona today with our, I guess we should be managing your expectations with our title, Ready for the Revolution, Realising a Digital Workforce Development Strategy. Um, and I think what we really wanted to do was to, uh, we convened a, a small group starting to look at how we can provide a model for RLUK member libraries to look ahead, to think about managing their digital workforce development along kind of complementary strands for both existing staff and also for upskilling uh, upskilling those existing staff, but also looking at recruitment and feeding into the RLUK strategy. And I think this, the strategy itself supports the digital shift manifesto as well by proposing that the we look at digital shift uh, skills audit to enable the members to benchmark their existing digital skills and capabilities. So I just want to say a couple of words just about the associate directors networks for anyone who uh, may not be either part of RLUK or not part of our network. It's the professional network for RLUK members in a deputy librarian or an associate director role. And it's a forum for discussing and sharing experience and the opportunity to participate in the business of RLUK and support succession planning. And I'm delighted that um, I have the opportunity to co-convene with Fiona Courage from the University of Sussex. And Fiona and I have been working for the last year with colleagues in a small group around the ADN, as well as some of the broader work which we've done. The three key strands of ADN activity are leadership development, peer network, and that wider RLUK support. And I think these strands all cut across into the workforce development work that we've been doing, as well as the digital shift um, activities, which um, RLUK have you know, really led the, the vanguard around that focus around to professional development, training and leadership sessions, and also some safe space. So hopefully that gives you some context as to where the ADN kind of sat and why we became the, the network which did some initial focus around this activity. But I'm going to hand over to Fyoda now, who has uh, could you talk a little bit more about the, the context and the model. Thank you, William. So why? Why do we need a strategy at this moment for our workforce? Why is it now? Um, I think uh, it, it's basically reflect, reflecting the rapid change that we've seen um, in the adoption of digital technologies in our work, in our lives, um, and also an adoption of a digital attitude to life. And of course, I hate to have to bring COVID into it, but COVID as well. So alongside these, I think we also need to recognise that there is a new generation coming into our workforce, and that's a generation that um, has a possibly a different attitude towards careers than those that many of us may have had. Um, they will be looking more to remote working, they'll be able to increase their geographical opportunities to work in places that they don't necessarily live in. And they may also expect more career changes through their lives rather than the sort of traditional route of a single career. So looking to change skills or to use their skills in new sectors. So all of these changes have sort of been recognised within RLUK and more broadly. 
And in terms of recognising this shift towards digital, the new RL UK strategy really recognises the transformative effect that digital technology has on research libraries. Um, and that this is a transformation that affects spaces, it affects practices and it affects people. Um, and in addition, the work of our colleagues um, in the digital shift network, no, sorry, <laughs> digital scholarship network. Yes, digital scholarship network, apologies. I know that it kept changing. Um, but the work that they've been doing is highlighted through um, the excellent digital shift forum series, which is sort of telling us more and more about how we need to adapt to a new world. Um, whilst RL UK's broader digital shift manifesto also looks to deliver opportunities to lead and influence how our digital technologies are exploited within our institutions. And of course, COVID, it's really necessitated our adoption of much more agile working practices. And in this adoption, we've kind of seen how digital has really infiltrated our lives in terms of not only the technology that we use to work and to live, but also um, our practice and our mindset. So this agility is something that we're obviously going to continue to use as we adopt hybrid working, as we adopt more hybrid learning for our students and our research practices as well. So we're also witnessing changes in our practices um, as well as acknowledging them. And we can see that many of our traditional library processes have become increasingly automated. And in response to this, there's therefore a need for a different set of skills to deal with automated systems. And these are often um, revolve around problem solving, around critical thinking and around analysis. Really interesting um, how it's sort of in some ways we talk about having single workforces and so forth and, and being agile, but we're also looking towards specialization much more. Um, maybe a talk for another day. But the wider changes in our institution as well, particularly around digital scholarship, open research and publishing means that we're also increasingly being seen as collaborators and institutional leads in new areas rather than just a support service. So how does this impact on the shape of our workforce? Well, it means we do need to seek out new types of skill sets, often specialised and from areas that may not be traditional to the library sector, such as gaming. We need to support this through developing our existing workforce and looking for our new workforces as well. So if we're looking to train our existing workforces, we need to look at the implications on how we approach uh, professional development. We need to look at recruiting from new sectors, which in itself has implications on how we recruit. And I know that yesterday um, in the last session, there were some really interesting discussions about how we might want to change the way that we recruit to increase uh, and be a more inclusive um, employers. So the digital, the nature of digital really means that these changes um, can be sector wide and we've got these opportunities for collaboration across networks that already exist, but also to create new networks. So taking all of these three areas together, um, we decided to look at developing a more coordinated approach to the change. Um, and that came out in our strategy. William, could you produce them? So what we've come up with is this um, model, which William will go into slightly more detail shortly, but basically taking three different strands, a strand of understanding of and then undertaking and then delivering in order to develop our existing workforce and to recruit our future workforce, altogether leading into a digital skills framework. So I'll pass back on to William now. Thanks very much, Fiona. So I just want to give everyone a, a flavour um, of each of these um, three strands and then leading into that because today is a really exciting day for us since we are actually sort of kind of formally launching the, the strategy. There's the, the, the text and the link is there in, in the chat so colleagues can, can kind of drill down to, to that. And I think the important thing around this is it's, it's a catalyst, it's a springboard for some discussion. But what we have focused on is around these three, first of which is understanding, is really starting to pull together as part of that strategic umbrella for the RLUK strategy, a number of the existing practices, initiatives and research 
around um, the work which has already been going on. There's been lots of exciting uh, work done. Obviously, we're you know, looking forward to our next speakers as well. We're going to focus on the Research Library's um, PD Bank, the development of digital competencies, the digital scholarship networks, rise of the transatlantic skills uh, forum around skills and knowledge exchange, the digital shift webinars, which have been incredibly popular and provided some real opportunities for wider staff engagement, lots of professional practice initiatives, particularly around HRC and TNA, and also the, the rebooting and the restart of the space program. And as Fiona commented, obviously some of this for us is set against that kind of context of um, kind of coming out of um, you know, the pandemic, of kind of COVID-19, the acceleration around hybrid working, the you know, that blend and that shift that's really driving a lot of technological and cultural changes. But I think it's also incredibly critical for us as a strategy here to recognize that RLUK members are also at different stages with their workforce. So one of the things that we build into that framework is that maturity cont continuum and where kind of various institutions are sitting. A critical part around the undertaking strand is the audit of skills. And I don't want to dwell too much on the, um, the kind of the, the position description back here, but I think there is some, some really exciting opportunities to do some work there around the development of new competencies, looking at trends, looking at other work, being able to pull in tools and other um, technologies such as JISC's digital capabilities tools, not only for our own staff, but also potentially looking at some of that around uh, you know, around our kind of students and our, our wider our wider community, focusing around some of our working cultures and also taking cognizance of the international and national networks. And I think some of that came through in the session that we had yesterday, the, the round table session, being able to, um, you know, sort of feed into and to, to take uh, advantage of building into those networks and those relationships and being proactive and coordinated across uh, our entire sector. The third and I think really challenging element is around the delivery. So there's three elements here. There's a training and development framework element, an evolving work cultures framework and an, advocate, and an advocacy and change element. So again, here, just to, to pick and mix a couple of these elements, there's recognizing the diverse skills and workforce, looking at embedding some of these flexible and agile skills. The fact that there is an ongoing digital skills journey, we're never actually going to be finished. And I think if we were all to reflect on where both we were personally and where some of our staff were with some of our digital skills, you know, even two years ago, I think you'll see there's Quite a been quite a journey around that, but also as well one of the things that came out as part of the research and the work that we had done uh, as a as a as a group is also the importance of you know what may be traditionally referred to as the softer skills. We can't make we can't just um, focus wholly on digital. There needs to be that balance around those. And in terms of evolving um, working cultures looking at how we nurture talent, that succession planning, looking at where we can continue to develop that. Um, in the, the previous session, um, there was a comment around one of the challenges around recruitment, uh, around that, and also, you know, our workforce, our skills, our staff are one of the richest and most important kind of resources and um, key elements of how we can deliver, you know, the world-class research library services, which we want to do. So we also need to leverage some of that technology, looking at how we can work with more geographically remote partners, more geographically remote workers, and some of our digital skills gap. And I think critically for us as in, within the Associate Directors Network, but also working with the other networks within RLUK, is looking at how we can advocate at that senior level institutionally for that support 
for that ongoing development and upskilling for those new staff and being able to actually empirically identify some of the data and some of the evidence around that, which can help facilitate and support some of what we actually need to do. I just want to hand back to Fiona now just to talk a little bit about where this then coalesces around a digital skills framework. You're, you're muted, Fiona. So there you go. We've all got to develop our digital skills in this new agile working and I still can't remember to take the mute off. <laughs> um, in terms of this digital skills framework, we're looking to um, lead it as part of our ADN um, and to bring together a, a smaller group working within that in order to lead into that. Um, and we're looking to engage across all of the RL UK networks that already exist, in particular the digital shift, um, but also to, as you can see from the previous um, slides, there are things such as advocation, um, sorry, advocacy um, and, and so forth also to think about where else we might need to focus um, in groups that might not be there and that could be subgroups that we develop in the ADN for example to look at um, training to look at recruitment and to share our skills and experiences across our network um, so the idea is to provide this refreshed 21st century post-pandemic baseline of digital skills and we will do that um, again within the ADN we're looking to create a smaller group to look at digital skills audits um, and we hope that it will be underpinned by strategic investment and again there were interesting discussions yesterday in the uh, long table um, about needing to have strategic investment both resource wise um, but also psychologically to in, ensure that people do have the space to be able to develop their skills to undertake professional development and so forth. Part of today we are delighted to launch this and really kickstart that discussion within the wider community and open our doors in terms of that engagement, which we will be looking at doing, reaching out to co-conveners and the broader uh, co-conveners of uh, all the networks during April, but also leading into discussions with our own um, ADN colleagues um, as well, and really sort of moving, moving this forward around these various strands and working collectively and collaboratively, I think, to really look at addressing a point, a, a, key, a key challenge, I think, which we can scale up um, in a better together approach within all of our RLUK libraries. So I think we're really delighted, we're really excited to be ready for this revolution around our digital workforce strategy. And just in case you missed it in, the chat, here's the URL, which we would like to thank our RLUK colleagues for making available, but I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank all the members of our ADN strategy workforce. This isn't just Fiona and I, this has been a collective effort and it's been really, really satisfying to, to do that work around that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Thanks to William and Fiona. And I, I love um, being given presence at the end of a presentation where we've got a link. We can all go out straight away after the session and have a look at that strategy. Um, I'm, I was thinking of questions throughout that and I hope other people are as well. So please do post them in the Q&A. Um, but we're going to move on to our next set of speakers now. So for this one, we've now got Matt Greenhall. Deputy Executive Director of RL UK, and Laurie Taylor, Senior Director for Library Technology and Digital Strategies from the University of Florida. And tying in really nicely to William and Fiona's talk, we've, we've got um, Matt and Laurie talking about the Position Description Bank. So this is their session on position descriptions over the pond, the experience and early results of the RL UK's onboarding into the ARLPD Bank. So I'll take it away. 
thanks so much for the introduction. And it's lovely how, um, how well these two uh, presentations fit together. Uh, we're really excited to be here today. I'm Lori Taylor, um, and I'm here with Matt Greenhall. So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk for about 15 minutes about the experience and early results of the RLUK's onboarding into the PD Bank. So we're going to start by introducing the PD Bank and cover a little bit about its origins and purpose. Then we'll provide an overview of RLUK joining this resource. And we'll talk about similarities and differences revealed by the onboarding of your RLUK members. And finally, we'll provide an overview of the early results of RLUK members joining this resource and uploading their job descriptions into the PD Bank. So we'll divide the talk between us, uh, talk for about 15 minutes, and then we look forward to questions afterwards. So to get started on the brief history, um, to give you a sense overall, the Research Libraries Position Description Bank, or the PD Bank, is a collection of position descriptions from major academic and research libraries. The PD Bank fosters the sharing of information through a browsable and searchable database that provides access to the collection or bank of PDs throughout Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States. The ARL or PD Bank supports the management of PDs for individual institutions, providing an effective organizational method and system that supports findability as well as archiving for long-term digital preservation. And it was developed based on specifications determined by library personnel officers through focus groups and other feedback channels. The PD Bank provides a more useful source for current PDs and depicts the evolution of positions and library functions and services as reflected over time in the PDs. So why was this created? Perhaps the most common collaboration between personnel officers from different academic libraries is the sharing of position descriptions. This was usually initiated by a request for samples over an electronic mailing list. The responses are hit and miss and not often distributed to the whole list and neither responses nor the requests are archived. Additionally, library human resources management staff spends a considerable amount of time and effort managing, archiving, locating, retrieving, and distributing position descriptions. These documents serve as, an important, as important elements of effective human resources management and are only useful if maintained, organized, and accessible. And techniques for and effectiveness in managing these documents can vary from institution to institution. So as on the slide, the need and value is really for sharing the position descriptions, tracking trends over time, projecting for the future, and new opportunities uh, from greater understanding of positions, competencies, and ways of working. The prehistory of this um, from 2006 to 2011, everyone needed to do this. And so management was at the local level with these shadow internal systems. At UF, um, our internal system was called Green Monster, colorfully named for its time. Um, but by 2012, it, planning began. Um, in 2013, the PD Bank launched. Um, soon after the onboarding of different consortia, starting with uh, the Association of Research Li of Southeastern Research Libraries, and then in 2014, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. So the PD Bank emerged at a time when we could share data in a centralized and consistent manner, and we acutely needed it with changes in the digital age, librarianship, and research with new positions. I like data management, digital scholarship, exhibits, and more. So shown here are UF's first data management librarian, Dr. Plato Smith, and UF's first exhibits coordinator, who's now uh, exhibits director, Lourdes Santa Maria Wheeler. These positions are within the last decade or so. So I've been at the University of Florida for 15 years, and both of these positions are new in my time here. So as we look at position descriptions, we can inform changes locally and across the profession. And just a note on that, I was looking at a different report earlier and saw that it was in 2004 that the Association of Research Libraries in the US approved digital as a means for preservation. So if we think about the span of time, how many people do we know who do digital preservation, digital collections, data management, all of these things that are really deeply interconnected and all of these uh, positions that are really relatively new in the overall scheme of things. So with that, I will turn it over to Matt. Thanks so much, Laurie. So I'm going to talk through the process of RUK joining the PD Bank. I'm going to give a bit of context of, of the process we went through. And I think most significantly, some of the things that we've learned along the way, and in particular, some of the things we've learned from RUK members uploading content into the PD Bank. So RUK's journey to join this really exciting and fantastic resource began back in October 2019. And it came from quite a specific place. 
It emerged from a discussion that was held at an international symposium, which was convened by our UK's Digital Scholarship Network, which was held at the British Library. This symposium explored the changing skills requirements and competencies around digital scholarship services within research libraries. And it was during these discussions and this event that colleagues from the ARL first introduced the PD Bank to us as a potential way of understanding those shifting and changing competencies and skills requirements within our libraries. From this event, we then began a series of lengthy conversations with the ARL in the United States and also our colleagues at the University of Florida regarding RO UK joining this resource. This included the collation and sharing of job descriptions from across the RO UK membership convened and collated by members of the DSN and also in involved some um, comments and review of some of the metadata fields of the PD Bank to make it more accessible and appropriate to our UK positions. And a big thank you to members of the DSN for supporting this process and advising on this from the outset. Following these discussions, we were then delighted to commit resource and support the onboarding of our UK into the PD Bank from January 2021, a little delayed um, because of the COVID crisis. The changes that were made to the system by University of Florida colleagues then resulted in the launch of the PD Bank for our UK members in June of last year. And we were delighted by the response from the our UK community to the opportunity of joining this resource. Since this launch event in June, 23 our UK member libraries have signed up to participate in this project. They have attended training and webinars, received guidance and support, both from the REK executive, but particularly from colleagues at the University of Florida. And we were delighted to see that in November 2021, the first uh, position description was uploaded from an REK member. There's now over 230 position descriptions in the PD Bank from REK members, or from five libraries in particular. And we hope that this number will continue to grow over the coming weeks and months. This process, the discussions we held with uh, colleagues in Florida and at the ARL, the conversations that we've had through some of the training sessions and the onboarding of our UK members into this resource has revealed some similarities and differences in the experiences between both UK and Irish North American uh, research libraries. There were some obvious differences which we noted from the outset in terms of the terminology used for contract types, for example, and different areas of, of library, uh, library skills and competencies, variations in acronyms, and the use of terms or use of the same terms, which maybe have slightly different meanings on both sides of the Atlantic. What we did note, however, were many similarities in the current experiences of research libraries on both sides of the Atlantic. Both UK, US and Canadian research libraries have been undergoing a significant period of restructure as their role and remit grows and diversifies over time. We've seen research libraries change their structures and organizational alignment. This is something we've also witnessed intensifying during COVID and post COVID. In part, this has reflected some of the wider changes within the recruitment landscape, particularly the, the Great Resignation, something witnessed on both sides of the pond in response to COVID-19. As individuals have left our organisations, particularly at very senior levels, this has provided opportunities for research libraries to look at their structures and their alignments and their teams. And this is something we've seen on both sides. We've also seen, and Fiona noted this in the, the previous presentation, the growth in both experience and expectation around flexible working and remote working on behalf of individuals within our organizations and particularly those seeking to join our organizations. As we explored briefly yesterday, um, there's been a real focus and an urgency around EDI or, or DEI, as it's often referred to in North America, in, in, in making our organizations more inclusive and diverse, particularly during the recruitment process. Reference to EDI is something we see within many of the job descriptions which are being uploaded by RUK members into the PD Bank. 
We've also been exploring the representation of these issues within North America, and in particular, the creation of very senior roles at director or associate director level around diversity and inclusion. So very senior posts being created within North American research libraries to really drive change around EDI. We've also seen and reflected on the importance of agility as one of the reflections from um, the COVID experience, but also as cited by William and Fiona a moment ago, and as featuring within our UK's Digital Shift Manifesto. The ability to deploy skills and competencies quickly across organisations in response to challenge or new processes or new responsibilities. The ability to move skills and move individuals and deploy them where they're needed in real time. We've also noted, and there'll be a, an event exploring this uh, through IALA in a few months' time, issues around the talent crunch and the fact that research libraries are um, involved and are placed with an incredibly competitive um, recruitment landscape, which can make both attracting and retaining staff and talent difficult, um, where not only research libraries sometimes can't compete on salary, but there are also increasing expectations around flexibility. So these are some of the headlines that we've explored through some of the training and some of the conversations we've had. I'll now briefly talk through some of the headline results from the uploading of position descriptions into the PD Bank by our UK members. As I mentioned at the outset, we've now had over 230 job descriptions uploaded into the PD Bank. These come from um, positions right across our organisations, from very senior posts and associate director roles to more junior roles, such as library assistants. So colleagues and REK members really are uploading a wide variety of roles into this resource. There is, however, a senior bias uh, to those which exist currently within the PD Bank. We've had uh, 54 uh, library archives and learning assistant roles but increasing numbers of head of units or department roles, manager roles, and as I mentioned, associate director roles also. So there is a great wealth of um, positions being uploaded, but there is a, a senior bias collectively in, in some of those currently being entered into the PD bank. The majority of roles, as you can see, are full time and the vast majority are permanent appointments. What's really interesting, though, and is something we'll explore in greater detail, is the requirement of professional qualifications within some of these positions. We see that uh, around 30% or 30%, just under a third of the roles uploaded into the PD Bank request a professional librarian or equivalent qualification. Just under 30% seek a professional qualification of one sort or another whereas just over 40% don't require any specific qualification to be, to, be, um, uh, to, to be held in order to apply for that role. This is something we'll delve into a little deeper, particularly as we get more and more position descriptions uploaded into this resource. What's really exciting as well about those that have been uploaded is that they're really contemporary. You can see that the, the vast majority of roles were created in 2021 at 73%. And a growing portion of the roles within the PD Bank uploaded by REK members were created this year. So this is a really contemporary and a living resource, which we hope that REK members will be able to utilize in the months and years to come. And you can see here represented some of the very early sort of statistical analysis and representation we can do with the data with this word cloud of words contained within job titles of those positions uploaded by REK members. When a position description is uploaded into the PD bank, the person uploading it is requested to assign it to a number of functional roles. What areas within the library does this role relate to? And you can see here with a bit more of a detailed breakdown, we can start to do analysis between those areas that our UK positions relate to, whether it's around branch unit or department management or, or access services, how the portion of the, the, these functional areas within our UK uploads reflect and relate to those within North America. So you can see currently there is a significant bias within our UK entries within the position description bank around branch unit and department management. Significantly more uh, roles relate to these areas within the UK submissions than in North America. The relative importance of subject specialisms, as you can see, this fairly similar percentages amongst those 
uploaded from our UK and those in North America. And also um, some of the um, import, similar importance around um, access services within the UK, where these aren't seen as, as quite as um, significant in terms of the uploads from North America. This has a big caveat. It only relates to just over 230 roles that we have within the position description uh, bank. These roles have only been uploaded so far by five RUK members. But you start to get a sense just from this very early data of the sort of analysis that we can do, not only looking at our own institutional skills and competencies and how they're changing, not only see how these relate to the wider REK consortium, but then be able to place us as a consortium within this wider international context. And after all, we are recruiting from an international uh, job market. This is a very quick illustration of the sort of analysis that we can start to do with this data, seeing the relative importance of functional areas between our UK and our Canadian equivalent, uh, CARL. Start to make this comparison. And this can be done across a wide variety of functional areas. And as we've just discussed, and as I just outlined, the PD Bank uh, contains submissions relating to a, a wide variety of functional roles within our institutions. We would firstly really like to thank the University of Florida and the ARL for all of their support with onboarding our UK members, but also to thank all of those colleagues who've made submissions and have attended training and attended these discussions to guess where we are now. The PD Bank will become more useful and more relevant to our UK members the more of us who are involved and the more job descriptions that are uploaded. So if your REK member is not yet a member of this project, please don't hesitate to email Christina or myself, and we can guide you through the process of joining the PD Bank. It's free to join as an REK member. It is, um, requires a very, very brief um, ag agreement to be signed and then some training to be attended. And other than that, you can then get access to the PD Bank, its data, and upload your own. And on that note, I will hand back over to Laurie who will pose a question. So we really uh, wanted to close with an opening. Um, we wanted to, everyone to think with us about what collaborative opportunities exist between research libraries to further explore the sharing of competencies. So some of the specificity for the questions on this, what will the next new roles be? Who are the people for these roles? Are they already in our institutions? Or where will, are we going to find them? Will some of these be shared roles? And how will we compete to hire? Access to an international data source of these PDs helps us to understand where we are now and to plot the future trajectory. RLUK just released the new strategy for 2022 to 2025, which deals heavily with EDI and the digital shift, as well as the overall transformation of libraries. RLUK and AHRC have also just released a new research engagement program and professional practice fellowship scheme for academic and research libraries. As the new strategy and programs begin, resources like the PD Bank afford opportunities to understand and thus help to share shape the transformation of our individual roles, institution, and profession overall. We're excited to work with others uh, in the sharing of PDs and using the PD Bank as a shared data source and to fully engage with the PD Bank as a data source for our community of practice focused on our collective future. And we wanted to th thank everyone um, for your time today. We're really excited for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Laurie and Matt. That was really, really interesting to see all that sort of really good detail and the sort of analysis you've done so far of the PD Bank. Um, I know that colleagues of mine have already used it um, to start, you know, fleshing out kind of roles that we're developing. Um, so it's really nice to hear a bit more and also to be challenged with that question at the end. I think as, you know, big theme about the talks today is uh, coming out of the pandemic. You know, we're, a lot of the digital services that we're developing have kind of accelerated because of COVID. Um, and we are, you know, almost playing catch up with a lot of that in terms of sort of now being able to develop new roles to support all of those developments. So it's really interesting to hear all of this. And um, we've got a few questions um, in the Q&A. So I'll just open that up. Um, Start at the top. We've got a, a couple from a colleague of mine here, LSE, Hannah. But this is a, a question for um, William and Fiona. This is a question about the RL UK strategy. It's been developed to answer specific questions around new skills gaps and changes in recruitment practice 
It sounds like early career librarians at RL UK libraries will be impacted by this strategy. Um, given the members of the ADN network are senior staff, what will you do to ensure that the voices and needs of early career librarians are heard? Quite happy to start off on that one, William, if you want to um, come in at any point. Um, th those voices are really important. Um, and uh, what we were, uh, what we are hoping to do is to essentially start off with an audit of what skills are, are there are, and also what may not be there. And I think some of the most important voices in informing that will be people who have just finished their qualifications, who are new in the profession, who um, will bring new and fresh ideas that those of us who have been in the profession for sort of 20, 30 years, who did our masters 20 years ago, will be able to inform us about um, what is needed. Um, I think there's 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 the, the the potential for people to worry about this in this sort of sense of well, does this mean that my the my existing skills aren't right? Are they not valued? But what we need to see is that all of our careers, all of our professions, are an evolution of skills, and we are constantly learning. And there was a lot of reference to this yesterday about librarianship being a learning profession, um, and therefore it should be seen as this. This is a really lovely way of of being able to develop our skills, develop our skill sets as individuals and as a sector, and um, I think it's really exciting, really exciting. I would absolutely um, completely agree there with Fiona. I think this possibly leans into with a bit of foreshadowing, possibly the next question. But also, um, I think actually, Hannah, I, I think clearly as a, a co-founder of an early careers um, kind of research uh, librarian, uh, kind of group and so on in London. I think you're somebody we should be talking to as well. It is absolutely not, you know, just, uh, you know, I think you want to think of the, the ADN as the, um, you know, as the the sort of the, the kind of, you know, tasked with the, the delivery and, the, and the, the focus around this, but it's absolutely not, you know, intended to be a senior staff echo chamber or in any way, shape or form, um, you know, not be wide open to all the, the kind of breadth and range that, that colleagues in the in the profession and in our institutions uh, have to offer. Thank you. Thanks for that. I think that, that definitely reflects, uh, you know, experience that I've had in sort of recruitment. It's not just about new roles and all of that. It's actually looking at, you know, reviewing job descriptions, developing people. That's one of the things that's really important to think about when you're looking at the overview of all the you know teams you have in a library and there are skills that are you know hitherto sort of untapped in people that you can start to surface and bring out and suddenly people find they're very excited about something and they'll you know we'll put them on some training and then suddenly they've got a new kind of area that they're they're you know working with so um I think that's that was a really good point that, that Hannah's making though about sort of being involved in that as early career um, did you want to follow on with her next question? Uh, oh, one second. Uh, yes, about looking at outside the traditional fields, what are the implications of that for uh, traditional library qualifications? Um, you see these qualifications are diminishing in importance in future recruitment. I think that's a really interesting question. And actually, I think that they absolutely aren't diminishing. I think actually, even if, you know, if we think about, you know, that engagement that we had in the round table yesterday, um, I think there's, there is perhaps some kind of re redefining of kind of librarianship or some kind of pushing around some of the edges. But I think those qualifications and the, we touched on yesterday, some of those underlying principles of librarianship, some of those kind of core activities, core roles, the values around kind of trust and authenticity and, and so on, I think actually are going to increase because, you know, you, that is, you know, very much kind of recognised as, you know, part of that, that qualification and those roles. So I, I think I see those, again, as, as sort of very complementary. We're going to be just matching, you know, the right staff for, you know, the right the right roles, looking at all of those, but I certainly do not see any diminishment around that, in my professional opinion, certainly. No. 
Yeah, yeah. Go on, Fiona, sorry. I was just going to say to add to that, I think we'll use the word evolution again, that, um, you know, all, all courses in the same way that our own personal professional development needs to evolve. So to these should evolve and, and we should all be involved in enabling them to develop um, and to make sure the skills are relevant but it will change and it's changing so quickly at the moment um, that you know certainly the course that I did 20 odd years ago is, is very different to the one that you know Hannah and colleagues will have done more recently so it's uh, yeah. yeah and I think there's a role for library schools there I mean if we go back from what we need um, it's, it's a classic thing of looking at how people are getting their qualifications and what those needs are when they're when they're learning definitely definitely okay uh we're going to go I'm just having a look in the the questions here um the question from oh this is another colleague of mine fabby um matt greenhall mentioned senior management bias in a uh, number of uh, job descriptions at management level against assistant level does the rate doesn't the ratio of managers assistant roles reflect the reality I just wondered if you wanted to make a comment about that in terms of how you feel it reflects the reality that you're aware of. Yeah, I think, and thank you, Fabi, for that question. I think it may well do. But like what's interesting, I think, and, and why maybe I'd a little caution in terms of the job descriptions that have been uploaded um, to the PD Bank so far from our UK members, uh, a number of these members who've done so have gone through wholesale um, sort of restructures. So there's been a, at all levels, so effectively there's been a flood of roles relating to um, many different positions simultaneously going in from right across the structure. Um, so that may not be reflective of the sort of more organic way that organisations recruit over longer periods of time. So I think you could be right. Yep, it could reflect actually that that, that is just a natural reflection um, of things. I would say at the moment, the, the data that's coming in is a little skewed and also we're using quite a small data set. So I think we'll be able to comment on that more as more and more members join. I'm not sure whether, Laurie, there's any reflections you'd offer from the US side. No, I mean, it's, it changes a lot based on need. Um, and so you will see things like when people are doing, you know, a reorganization or restructuring, and you'll see a ton of updated position descriptions. Um, and sometimes people start from the top. And so different processes, um, the wealth of the, the value of the data really increases over time, because then these anomalies um, just become part of the larger scope of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've also had a question from Stuart Dempster about the openness of the PD Bank. Um, so uh, he says here, ARL and RL UK members are committed to open access scholarship, etc. If I am right, many of the PD bank resources sites behind uh, an authentication layer, excluding many from access to key resources. In future, could foundation funding be thought to open up the resource to allow others to benefit from this worthwhile endeavour, perhaps? Absolutely. Um, but one of the reasons why it's closed right now is to make sure people can be onboarded and they understand the data source and the resource for it. Um, so anyone um, can contact if it's a consortia thing, um, you can contact Matt Greenhall um, or whoever, you know, your consortia is. Um, but really, we're trying to have people contact their own institutional leads within their institution. Um, and those people can set up a, basically a researcher account. So you just have view only access. The reason we want to do this is it really is a community of practice and we want people to be in conversation with each other. Um, we also want to know what you're finding, what obstacles you're coming into with the uh, PD bank so that we can have a virtuous process for improving it. But some of it, if you're not an HR professional already and a long-term one, some of the terminology, it, it's just not the way you think. And then when you're dealing with an international data source, obviously the, the terms have been updated. That's been some of the great work um, with RLUK but it doesn't always make sense. Um, and so like so many data banks, you do have to register for an account and be in contact with folks to make sure that you're most supported for using the data. But that's been the approach to date. That doesn't mean that that is the correct approach. So, you know, launched in 2013. Um, I normally say digital projects live in dog years. It's a rapid evolution. So if this is something that comes from partners and that this is what folks want, um, that's great for us to know um, and then to plan on changes. Thank you. Just, Thank you very much for that. I'll just quickly add to yeah. that, Nancy. Just um, so if you if your member is a particip is participating in the uh, PD Bank process, you will have an institutional lead who is sort of the named individual responsible for your in for your institution, and they can provide access to any colleague working within your RA UK member 
to the PD bank. So you can get access via your institutional lead if you're participating. The other thing I'd very briefly mention is, as Laurie just uh, cited, you can get and there can be researcher access given to the PD bank. And we've been exploring the opportunity of using the data set and providing access to um, some of the uh, students doing master's dissertations in iSchools, for example. As it's a really live data set around skills and competencies. So we are looking at how we can share this data so in, a, in a controlled way outside of the immediate REK community as well, and certainly applaud um, uh, openness. Thank you. That's really useful to know. I think that's something else that you just touched on, which was a question I had um, about or comment about seeing how roles actually develop over time. So it'd be interesting perhaps in the future once you know, new roles, uh, sort of new versions of roles get added to it, see how different roles actually evolve. Um, you know, the same role, but different different skills. Um, I have a question from Martin Reed: Is the ADN going to use any existing framework to carry out the intended skills audit? I think that's for William and Fiona. Ooh, thanks very much, Martin. Um, I think there's a range of options there, and one of the things that we really as part of what we were looking at were the, the just digital skills and the just digital capability so that's something which actually university of glasgow has recently um, subscribed to so we're really interested in looking at that as a potential framework that's around building capacity and capability around both kind of staff and students as an initial framework but i think also as part of our Kind of outreach and our engagement we're interested in um, anything that we might have missed so there is this uh, as part of our um, kind of undertaking element there's some really interesting crowdsourcing opportunities as well there since we, we possibly might not have all the answers and I think it was really useful you know yesterday's kind of round table which was a really um, good example of some of the kind of events which we want to look at kind of hosting to further engage the, the community going forward around this strategy. Okay, thank you. Um, next question from Ellie Cope, which says lots of talk about early career professionals, but what thinking is being done about supporting mid-career professionals who might not be interested in moving into management, but who do want to develop their skills? So I, I'm assuming that one's for William and as well. Thank you. So a huge part of the frame of the digital tools strategy is to look at um, developing our existing workforce as well as how we recruit a new workforce. And in terms of mid-career professionals, uh, you know, that, that's the relevant part. And I think things like the audit skills um, and any additional sort of uh, focus group work that we may do, reaching out to the wider community that we will do, we'll start to fill in what those requirements may be. Um, and we can start to look maybe as a network and as a, a sort of a, a broader sector in terms of whether there are sort of um, very specific but widely required things that could be supported and look to ways to support them in order to share the, the resource burden of that or um, about developing competencies within institutions and sharing those as well. So this is very much not just about um, new professionals, it's about mid-career, it's about managers as well and the skills that are required there, um, as well as looking at new people coming into the profession before they've even taken those qualifications. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, next question, we're back to Matt and Laurie. Um, Oh, hang on a second. It says, I wonder if the PD Bank has a general trend towards shorter job descriptions aiming to define more standardised skills borrowed from other sectors, e.g. product manager, data scientist, UX, UI specialist, or are there no discernible trends in the style of job descriptions yet? Overall, for all libraries to date, there's not really a discernible um, single style. And um, we do have some things that come in automatically from the job posting system for the Association of Research Libraries. Those are shorter, um, but they're not short. Um, and then a bunch of us use this as our, our replacement for our shadow system. Um, and so our full position descriptions, uh, like for the University of Florida, are loaded. And we, we also upload revisions over time. So some of them are pretty giant. You know, they tell you about the University of Florida, about the libraries, about the city of Gainesville, Florida. You know, they have all of that additional um, information in it. Matt, I don't know if you've seen a trend. 
Yeah, but it's too early. I think it's, it's too early to tell for our UK. Other than just echoing what Laurie said, some of the length of the descriptions are, are not are not short. These these are quite detailed descriptions in terms of what is being sought for and the type of individual and the placement of the organisation and its current strategic focus. So they are very detailed. There are some shorter ones, but I'd say uh, that length that um, Laurie just describes correlates with what we're starting to see in our UK members as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another question about the PD Bank here from uh, Paolo Marchioni from GISC. Is there any intention to include also non-research libraries in the PD Bank? That hasn't been the conversation that I've been involved in debate, but that doesn't mean that it can't be. Um, just when you look at different um, different fields, professions, and different ways to um, slice um, and what terminology, what's most useful for the situated, the designated community, the community of practice for it. So the conversations have been on adding perhaps um, an Australian um, research library group, mm -hmm. um, perhaps looking once we also go outside of English, I mean, we're already operating in multiple versions of English. And so it, that adds a complication. I, it's open for discussion. Um, and Matt, you've been more involved in some of those conversations, I think. Um, so I think, um, yes, there is that potential. I think at the moment, really encouraging that diversity of roles from research libraries, which may not traditionally be associated with research libraries as a real focus. I know uh, our colleagues in the Special Collections and Heritage Network and the work with university museums and galleries, and really trying to encourage the inclusion of those roles um, outside a, a library uh, sort of traditional um, uh, description, in encouraging those roles to appear within the PD Bank will be important as well. But um, I agree with Laurie that there is great value in having a similarity and a comparability, uh, ability to compare between different institutions. And obviously the wider you get um, the more difficult it might be to make that comparison but certainly always open to explore those opportunities that's great thank you i think we've got time for one more question because this one might be slightly more longer uh, slightly longer answer this is from michael williams I'm more interested to hear about the skills audit uh, that fiona and william mentioned we're starting an audit in my area collections exactly two years ago which stalled for obvious reasons and we're now in a very different world even though we retain significant it's on print collection development and management many of my team are shifting in different ways to digital so could you say a bit more about how the skills audit might work please we've got two minutes left by the way <laughs> so we feel and i very quick answer Not is sure, yeah. i yes as i've already mentioned uh, I think there's a couple of elements there. One is that just digital skills, digital capability element, but I think another really important dimension, it's something we're also having a look at at Glasgow just now as well, is the, the digital shift manifesto and looking at the kind of strategy, uh, looking at the various dimensions around that, around scholarship and skills uh, and space and so on. And I think that's incredibly valuable for helping to to frame and have a look at some of those skills audits so i think what Fiona and i will probably be taking away from this without putting words in Fiona's mouth is these are these are some really great questions and it's really exciting to see some of that um catalyzing and uh ongoing discussion which the uh, the, the throwing the strategy out there now has really, really generated. So our challenge is now to, to look at how we take that forward and actually feed back in with some of these uh, these, these colleagues around that because the, the strategy is an evolving and ongoing piece of activity yeah. um, as well. 